Welcome to the 14th edition of our podcast series, Talking Data, which offers timely insights into macro data and its impact on the economy and markets. I'm Kristen Radish of Arbor Research and Trading. I will be today's moderator. Today's podcast features Ben Breitholtz and Pete Forbes of Arbor Data Science. Ben and Pete will be discussing alternative data and machine learning. Pete, we're gonna start with you today. What's happening with alternative data in 2020? The spotlight is certainly on it. Can you walk us through what's been happening? Absolutely, and good afternoon, Kristen. Thanks for having us on. So I think everyone is trying to get ahead of the speed of reported data, knowing how fast things are changing in the economy right now. The challenge for everyone is to get as real time as possible in what we are seeing with the actual financial markets and the economy and trying to stay on top of that. And the fun part about our approach to uh, alternative data and specifically our focus on Google search data is how versatile it's been as we try and evaluate this new landscape. So the traditional use case for Google search data was more on the consumer interest side. And what we've really been able to do is drill farther into other areas like manufacturing, energy, transportation, and other sectors that people weren't using this data as much for. And this has really illuminated a lot of things that we wouldn't have necessarily seen in industries like renewable, renewable energy or factory automo automation and really identifying opportunities that you wouldn't see just by looking at more one dimensional alternative data like footfall, traffic or you know, MTA or TSA throughput and things of that nature. Yeah, I totally agree. So the you know the big thing is trying to find breadth, and uh, a lot of the data that Pete and I also look at. Pete's big with mobility data, um, and we do look at a lot of other sources. Uh, but they're you know they're kind of uh, narrow and focused, and have short track records. You're not really able to get a, a you know a more versatile view um, of the consumer and the business. So the, the neat thing about, again about the search activity is we can. We know how many people are searching for bankruptcies and we know how many people are going, you know, searching for parks that are nearby to get out of their homes and, and, and eventually get back in the community or, you know, buying groceries. Um, and then like Pisa on the industrial side, it could be researching factory automation to, to anything. So um, I think that, uh, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a unique uh, situation and one that's difficult for investors because there's so much of this now out there in front of them. Um, and I think there's groups like us that are trying to do our best to take the you know the best of the best in, in in our case public data sources and get that in the hands easily for investors without having to go through all the rigmarole of dealing with all these disparate you know kind of focused data sources. Pete, what is the what is an underrated tool in using machine learning to predict financial markets and the economy? Well, so. The big challenge in March and April of this year is we saw the sudden stop in the global economy, um, in particular for us and the way we view forecasting financial markets and economic activity was we tried to, in the past, see through the noise of the ultra short term and instead focus on what was going on with underlying trends. What changed in March and April is that we suddenly had to be measuring what's happening in the moment. And to help our clients really get on top of that, we tried to pivot to measuring much more fast twitch responses in search activity so that we could get a shorter term handle on what we expected in financial markets, what we expected to be happening right now and in the next you know, months going forward for the economy. And an open source algorithm from Facebook called Profit was really at the key to our ability to pivot to looking at things a new way. And Profit is designed, the real advantages for us are the speed and the robustness of the forecasts. It's really worked well with search data in terms of being able to forecast that type of time series data. Um, but really the advantage for us has been just the speed and the versatility of it, rather than having to spend months and months trying to craft our own sort of uh, elaborate or maybe more complex forecasting algorithms for the search data that isn't necessarily the core of where we're adding value for clients. We are able to put this in place quickly and have a robust benchmark uh, that we could measure short-term movements off of. So if you are working with time series data in any way, uh, this is a very easy open source library to get started with, and we would definitely encourage you to try it if that's a use case that you have. And I can vouch for that. You know, Pete's just, uh, kind of use of profit and these forecasts and then benchmarking search activity off of that has been just uh, fantastic. And some of the best charts we have are, are products of that research. 
One thing I'd add too, I think that natural language processing, you know, it was, it was since maybe 2016, 2017 has really improved dramatically. And the, the NLP that Pete and I do on the Federal Reserve has been a great, that's been more based on lexicons we've built specifically for the Federal Reserve. Uh, but we're getting more and more into kind of the state of the art. And just like Pete said, it, the ability to get granular and offer short-term signals is kind of what we're trying to do more and more. And I think the political landscape now with the fiscal policy debate um, has really put potentially the natural language, natural language processing of press conferences and other political discourse, you know, kind of front and center. And something that we really um, are trying to track on a gauge of uncertainty and then overall general sentiment to benchmark against, you know, what is the media? What is the, what are investors thinking? And really, is there a disconnect? And is that something that's going to close that could cause some, you know, burst in a volatility? Um, and we can get into that in, in, in a few in a few minutes. But um, you know, th th we have seen that um, kind of take place where politicians are starting now to get uh, quite uncertain, but investors are not. And um, I think NLP again, uh, recursive uh, neural networks um, and type new types of modeling techniques to deal with really long-term dependencies and sequence of words have come a long way. And that's something that Pete and I are just you know, kind of getting more heavily into. Um, and I think that's something that's kind of underappreciated, especially especially in financial markets and macro analysis. And Pete, what's the biggest challenge in applying machine learning to financial markets? Well, I think a lot of people would point to maybe some of the technical or modeling challenges, you know, model drift, that type of thing. Um, but I, for us, really, I think it's been more about expectations. Um, financial markets and especially most of financial services outside of the frontline markets fields have really already embraced financial data science and machine learning to some extent. And the real market side of things has been sort of a late frontier for that. And there are still a lot of people in the business who are used to a more traditional quant background where the requirements for using a new data set were things like hey, seeing at least 10 years of data, long track records or extensive back testing. And a lot of those methodologies, um, while there's certainly a lot of value in them, they faced a lot of new challenges in this environment this year when we had such um, series breaks and major changes in the types of data that they typically follow. So what's been exciting for us is this sort of bold new world of people trying to break out of those expectations has actually been a big opportunity and a way to open a few eyes about some of these alternative data sources that don't necessarily fit into that box of 10 years of data, you know, robust back tests across all different kinds of markets. Uh, we can pull value out of sources that are a little less traditional, and it's been exciting to be a part of that sort of loosening of those expectations. Yeah, and, and, and on top of that too, a lot of what um, you know, Pete and I try to do is um, communicate a lot of sometimes these complicated models, and that's that's where things get get difficult. And in our years of working with um, you know with clients a lot of what they want is something that's interpretable and understandable and they want to be able to explain that potentially to their underlings or their own their you know their managers or investors um, and that's that's part of the the difficulty here is getting the key stakeholders those key decision makers which typically aren't going to be um, you know heavy machine learning uh, individuals to really understand those components and the good thing is uh, machine learning's come a long way too with uh, the ability to bur burrow into variable importances as well as new modeling techniques to get a flavor for um, how components are working with one another and what they're um, uh, doing to produce a, sp a specific result. Um, and that's kind of, that's really kind of one of, you know, jo uh, Pete and I's jobs is to, um, you know, make that really simple uh, within our writing and communicate effectively. Say, hey, we've all this amazing data, you know, um, uh, search activity from all across the world, all these different pieces, municipalities and, you know, search categories. And we might combine them into forecasts or into models. Um, we have to explain how that how that works. Um, and uh, fortunately, again, that, that is a challenge. It's something that's getting easier. And the good thing is people are getting more and more up to speed in this industry, um, alt data, but then also machine learning in general. So just the education side has improved, but that's still, again, a major challenge. Thank you both for your thoughts on that. I thought next we'd move into some current topics uh, for this week. And if you'd like to start us out, Pete, we, let's talk about the housing market. We had some news released today. Can you touch on that? Absolutely. Thanks, Kristen. So yeah, the housing uh, has really been an engine of economic momentum for the U.S. in this recovery. It's been a big focus of ours. Um, we've talked a lot about how exceptional conditions are for home builders in particular. 
Um, they're really benefiting from the combined tailwinds of extremely low inventory, low interest rates, very motivated buyers, and still remarkably given a lot of the shocks to employment, um, a very large pool of able buyers who are in the market for some sort of upgrade to their housing situation. So today's data releases were absolutely a sign that the housing market is continuing with the momentum that we expected into the fourth quarter. Uh, we're particularly encouraged by building permits. This is an economic data series that we like a lot for just the predictive power that it has all the way through the channel. Um, strong strength in permits will ultimately flow through into single family starts and then into the rest of the economic activity that goes along with single family home construction. Everything from furnishings to appliances to building materials. Um, so there's a lot of economic activity that feeds off of this. We're counting on um, housing contributing a lot of momentum to the U.S. economy as we try and get through what may be a difficult winter for the consumer services side. And today was very much an encouraging release on that front. Um, the, the momentum we expected to be there in September certainly was and looks on track to be there again as we begin to see reported data come through for October. Uh, yeah, housing is one thing that just doesn't stop, and it's amazing. Uh, you know the, um, what you've been putting out, Pete, too, consistently showing the the strength, um, specifically in uh, you know real estate listings, uh, properties, and you know in inspections and so on, kind of the further down the food chain of of that cycle have been uh, so spot on. It's amazing too that you know retail sales um, is also continuing to to go um, and do well, even things like you were just saying with um, with appliances, uh, even though inventories are, are very short and your know, prices have come up, um, it, it is it is um, impressive how strong uh, the consumer remains. Again, thanks a lot to the save you know, increased savings rate, um, uh, but it's it again it, it seems like housing is the leading indicator of of uh, financial markets and really the economy. Ben, can you talk next on the COVID-19 spread when you're using the Google search criterion data? Yeah, so we've seen a, uh, a surge. Uh, we started to see it towards the kind of the tail end of August, surprisingly. And that has to do with a series that we look at really six different search um, terms that individuals use, everything from anosmia, which is the loss of taste and smell, uh, to shortness of breath, overall COVID symptoms, which people you know do quite a bit, um, uh, sore throats, and so on. And and we, we've seen a jump that's kind of on par with what we had uh, witnessed in early June when the South and the Southeast and portions of the West saw their spike in cases. Uh, you know, right now we're seeing all of those search categories jump, uh, specifically in places like Wisconsin, the Dakotas, Missouri, Tennessee. Um, but the good thing is that that search activity is still somewhere just shy of those June levels, um, something we haven't seen really rocket higher. Um, and on the flip side, typically when we see periods of, um, you know, we get the get a surge in COVID here um, or any kind of event, typically you'll get individuals that then go over here and say, well, you know, is there economic news I need to be worried about? Fiscal policy maybe in this case now um, that I need to get more information about. That search activity has rebounded, but not anywhere on par with what we saw March through May. Um, I think that's a reason why financial markets are, are okay and still remaining quite um, sanguine and um, you know, and still rallying for the most part. Um, and, uh, and, you know, I think that uh, ultimately we've got to watch and see as we are going to potentially push above 60,000 cases um, a day here in the U.S. on a seven-day average basis. Um, you know, what is that? Is that stress level showing up? Are people getting that concerned that, you know, search activity for symptoms is, is exploding? And then also the searches that uh, denote stress like economic news, and fiscal policy news and so on, is that going to brew too? Hasn't yet. Um, and again, I think those will be some of the key triggers on a short-term basis that will get ahead of potentially some volatility uh, and pullback that we will probably see at some point here um, you know, before year end. And our last topic um, today, if you could please, let's just talk touch on the rising uncertainty among officials via NLP uh, press conferences. And you touched upon it um, uh, kind of at the beginning of our segment, but if you could go ahead and just um, talk about that and, and how it's affecting us this week, I'd, I'd appreciate it. Yeah, what are the really neat data sources, or not sources, um, kind of corpuses or data that we put together is all of the press conferences and uh, briefings by 
officials that can be governors, senators, mayors, WHO, and so on, uh, pertaining to COVID-19. We also actually pull in all of them in general for all political um, uh, kind of discourse. But uh, what we've seen is a rise again over the past three weeks in this level of uncertainty from officials. And that is about halfway um, to reaching the peak that we had saw in, that we'd seen in June. Um, which was um, also when we saw a little bit of a market swoon kind of in late May, um, same thing within March. And it's just like I was talking about the pre previous set of comments, um, we're watching to see if that uncertainty that officials are offering to the population in general uh, rises to, to that crescendo, to that level that we saw in March and June. Um, we've found that is a leading indicator and ultimately does get the citizens and the, consu the consumer base riled up and concerned. Um, and so that's, again, another feature we're watching now. Again, on the flip side, uh, investors and uh, news trends and so on uh, regarding um, the actual degree of uncertainty centered around COVID-19 and the fiscal policy story um, is it, it's quite different. So the uh, news trends and the um, and investors in general remain quite optimistic. So if we burrow into, for example, a, a one data source we like is the Television News Archive which we're able to get into Bloomberg, CNBC, CNN, and so on, and see how are commentators and, and guests talking about fiscal policy news and, and COVID-19. And that has remained uh, surprisingly, overwhelmingly positive uh, over the past week and a half, much much to people's chagrin. And you know, and, and we see a lot of strife and, and uh, kind of uh, nasty comments on Twitter uh, about how can this be? Um, how, are, and how are markets st st uh, so resilient? Well, you know, the narrative, um, for the most part, uh, from news and investors is is positive, and that's been correlated with the equity market, things like inflation, inflation expectations, small cap stocks, and that's something uh, that again needs to be watched. Um, and I think that kind of that short term one to seven day window into news sentiment um, and into this natural language processing of um, of either television news archive and then all the way on the flip side uh, politicians will be important here going into year end um, as this fiscal policy story uh, gets more and more confusing and, and same with COVID-19. Well, thank you both for joining us today, Ben and Pete. We appreciate it. And thank you to all of our listeners for joining us today. As a reminder, Arbor Research and Trading is an institutional research and brokerage firm that produces innovative research across a broad range of global fixed income, equity, currency, and commodity markets. Bianco Research and Arbor Data Science are our two most prominent research offerings. For further information on Arbor Research, Bianco Research and Arbor Data Science, please contact Gus Handler at gus.handler at arborresearch.com.